Hi, here's a lecture on antennas. And uh, this is an introduction to antennas. And I think the easiest way to start learning about antennas is to understand what happens in the transmit case. So that's where we'll begin. To understand how an antenna transmits, I think it's actually a logical place to start by asking the question, why do transmission lines not transmit? After all, if you think about a transmission line, it consists of, in this case, I'm drawing parallel wires, and these wires have currents on them, shown in red. And uh, typically, uh, in a well-designed transmission line, those conductors are much, much less than a wavelength apart. And uh, also, of course, you know that those currents are flowing in opposite directions on the two conductors. Well, each current should radiate, and in fact it does. So you could ask the question, why doesn't a transmission line transmit? Well, the reason is because each one of those currents uh, are paired up with another current on the other conductor, which is flowing in the opposite direction, which means when you add the contribution of the radiation from those two currents in the far field, they cancel out, right? In other words, you can think of this current canceling out this current and that happening for every other pair of currents on the transmission line. So to the extent that this condition about the spacing is true, you don't expect to see uh, radiation from a transmission line. Of course, to the extent that's not true, you do see radiation. Next, consider what happens if we bend the ends. And the way we're going to bend the ends is simply to take the end and bend it at right angles like so. And if we do that, you see that the current on the ends is expected to flow as indicated in the highlighted region here. And in that case, those two currents are going to create radiation that doesn't cancel in the far field. In particular, you see this current can radiate in this direction, this current can radiate in this direction, and that radiation will be in phase. So we expect power to be transferred away from the antenna. So that's the simplest antenna that you can imagine. And as a result, power is being transported into the far field. So basically all antennas are some variant of this, where we have currents in a structure which can add in phase in the far field, creating radiation which is non-zero in the far field. Next, let's consider a circuit model. In other words, what we'd like to do is be able to understand how to use an antenna. And um, you know, if we're using an antenna, it's going to be connected to a transmitter, if we're using the antenna as a transmit device. And we can model a transmitter as a Thevenin equivalent circuit. And Thevenin equivalent circuit it consists of a voltage source in series with the Thevenin series impedance. And in this case, the antenna should appear as an impedance. So the question arises, what is the impedance of an antenna? So let's examine this for a moment. If we consider the power associated with the radiation from this antenna, we'll call that P sub rad. And this model, P sub rad, is the power dissipated in the impedance. In other words, if I think of the antenna as being this impedance, then the radiated power is the power which is dissipated in that impedance in this model. Now, Z sub A, the impedance of the antenna, is simply, in fact, by definition, the ratio of voltage to current, right? Where V sub A is this voltage appearing across the antenna here, and then I sub A is the current flowing through the antenna. And that's true, but it really doesn't tell us much at this point. Right? We don't know enough really about those voltages and currents and how they're related to determine an impedance. It's possible to do this, but it's not the easiest way to understand the impedance yet. The easier way is to imagine it from the physical perspective. In the physical perspective, first note that the impedance consists of a real part, we'll call that R sub A, and an imaginary part, we'll call that X sub A. And furthermore, we can resolve the real part into a radiation resistance, R sub rad, and a loss resistance, R sub loss. R sub rad, the radiation resistance, represents the energy transferred into radiation. R rad represents the power that we were addressing in this model, as shown at the top of the page. Our loss represents energy dissipated, which is actually dissipated, dissipated in the sense of being turned into heat. Right? So we've identified two things that can happen here. We can radiate power, and we can dissipate power in the antenna in the form of heat, presumably due to limited conductivity of the materials used in the antenna. And then, of course, X sub A. 
exa A is a reactant, and reactants means energy stored. All right, so X sub A is representing the tendency of the antenna to store energy. Now, how is it storing energy? Well, in electric and magnetic fields, of course. So, the connection between the circuit model that I show at the top of the page here and the physics that I've just pointed out is that the radiation power, the power that's been radiated away from the antenna, should be related to the current flowing through the antenna and the radiation resistance through this relationship here, as it would be for any circuit, right? In other words, the power associated with some resistance is one-half I sub A squared magnitude squared times the resistance. Now, the thing to note well here is to realize that this radiation resistance is not a physical resistance in the sense of something turning something else into heat. It is simply the way we model the radiated power in the circuit model, right? So in this case, what we're calling resistance is, in fact, the radiated power, not uh, the power lost in limited conductivity. That is R sub a loss. So this leaves us with the question of what is R sub rad? How do we get a number for that? And of course, that's going to depend on the specific antenna. And there will be some follow-up, of course, addressing these things. But let's just summarize what we know at this point. So summarizing, we connect the antenna to a source. Right? In this case, we thought of it as a Thevenin equivalent source. Of course, that can represent any source. Second, we let a current flow through the antenna. And that current in the circuit model is simply the Thevenin voltage divided by the sum of the Thevenin impedance and the antenna impedance. Right? This is the point in which impedance mismatch is going to play a role. In other words, the antenna has some impedance, the source has some impedance, and to the extent that those are mismatched, we're going to limit the power. How is the power going to be limited? Well, because it's going to affect the value of I sub A. Once we have I sub A, then the power radiated is determined in the usual manner in circuit theory by that expression. That's power radiated in the far field. So that's really it, and really the only thing left to figure out here is what the antenna impedance is, and specifically what the radiation resistance is. Okay, part two. What about that wave? What form does it take? How much power is sent in particular directions? You probably already realize that antennas send more or less power in different directions depending on the design of the antenna. Certainly true, so let's get started with a framework for describing that. Uh, here is uh, the antenna. I've kind of compactified the model that I talked about in the first part of this lecture. And I'm showing it radiating outward, these uh, phase fronts. So the first thing you should realize is that in the far field, that is far away from the antenna, distances which are much greater than the physical dimensions of the antenna, we have a spherical wave, at least something which is very close to being a spherical wave. So we expect these phase fronts to be spherical and expanding outward uh, as a spherical wave would. Total power, P rad, units of watts, is being radiated away. And if we look at one small patch here in the far field, we can define a power density. And what we mean by power density is how many watts per square meter at that point. You can think of it as how much power is flowing through that little aperture I've shown here. Our in this uh, expression refers to the point at which we're measuring that. So as we are accustomed to doing in electromagnetics, we define R as some unit vector times the distance. And the unit vector, of course, is pointing radially away from the antenna. And uh, R, uh, the scalar, is the distance from the antenna. Next, we can define an average power density. And what we mean by average power density is power density averaged over a sphere of radius R. The power density at any point on the surface of the sphere is varying, but the average over the sphere is some value that depends only on the distance. Right? So that value is simply the total power radiated by the antenna divided by the area of that sphere through which the power is flowing. So P rad divided by 4 pi r squared, because 4 pi r squared is the area of a sphere having a radius r. So there is the power density at a point, and S sub av is the average power density at a distance. Now with that laid out, we can now make a definition. 
An isotropic antenna is one for which the power density at any point on a sphere of radius r is equal to the average power density at that distance. In other words, an isotropic antenna radiates power uniformly in all directions. So if you have an isotropic antenna, the power density here is the same as the power density here, is the same as the power density here, same as the power density here. If you're a certain distance away from the antenna, you see the same power density. That is an isotropic antenna. So there's two essential things that you should know about isotropic antennas, and the first one is that they don't exist. There is no such thing as an antenna which radiates power uniformly in all directions. So your natural question to ask at this point is, why are we talking about it? Well, that's the second essential thing to know. An isotropic antenna is an ideal reference for describing the power radiation pattern of a practical antenna. It is a baseline against which we can describe the manner in which other antennas distribute the power which they radiate. So, that brings us to directivity. Directivity is exactly that. It is a way of describing the power density relative to the average power density. So we define directivity being a function of theta and phi, the direction in which we're uh, making the measurement, as being the ratio of the power density in that direction divided by the power density over all directions at some distance. So the first thing you can note here is that the numerator is proportional to 1 over r squared. Power density in any direction is going down as 1 over r squared because that's what spherical waves do. Secondly, the denominator is proportional to 1 over r squared. Why? Because if you average over something that's going down as 1 over r squared and you keep r constant, then that quantity is also going to be proportional to 1 over r squared. So since we're, we have a 1 over r squared dependence in the denominator and 1 over r squared depends on the numerator, directivity is independent of distance. And that makes it very useful, right? We wish to refer to the way the power density is distributed in a way that doesn't depend on how far away from the antenna we are. We just want to say in a certain direction, here's how much power density you're sending. In another direction, here's how much power density we're sending. But we want to make that independent of the distance. And that's what directivity does for us. Next, note that directivity is a unitless ratio of power-like units, right? Power density is a power-like unit, has units of watts over meters squared. Um, so does average power density. So we're talking about the unitless ratio of quantities which are power-like, have power-based units. Note that for an isotropic antenna, the directivity is 1. This should be very, very clear, right? Because the average power for an isotropic antenna is equal to the power in any particular direction. That's what makes it isotropic. So for an isotropic antenna, directivity in any direction is 1. For any realizable antenna, we find that the maximum directivity, not the directivity in any particular direction, but the directivity in the direction which is maximum, is always greater than 1. So let me give you an example here. This blue curve represents the power density in a isotropic antenna, and the green curve represents a typical pattern from a dipole-like antenna. So what you see is the maximum directivity has to be greater than 1, whereas the directivity of an isotropic antenna is always equal to 1. So this is an important thing to know. I will repeat this one more time to reveal a common pitfall, and that's that the directivity of a practical antenna can actually be less than 1 in some directions, but the maximum directivity of a practical antenna is always going to be greater than 1. So next note uh, the following. The directivity, which we've defined as being the power density in some direction divided by the average power density at that distance, well, we can also write the denominator as the power density in some direction for an isotropic antenna, because an isotropic antenna is one which has the same power density in all directions. Then we can divide the top and the bottom by the average power density in some direction and apply the definition of directivity. We find that directivity can be described as simply directivity divided by the directivity of an isotropic antenna, which is 1, right? So why do I do this rather contorted uh, a little derivation here, is to emphasize that one way that we can characterize directivity is with respect to the directivity of an isotropic antenna. In other words, 
the natural units of directivity are directivity with respect to an isotropic antenna. So if we do this in decibels, then we take 10 log 10 of the directivity. That's 10 log 10 because we have power-like units. And we end up with units of dB, but specifically dB relative to isotropic. And so when we write this down, we say we have units of dBi. I means relative to isotropic. It is simply the natural units of directivity, again, because we have this relationship here. So 10 log 10 of the directivity gives you dBi. The directivity of an isotropic antenna is 1, but in dB it's 0 dBi, as we say. And then the maximum directivity of a realizable antenna is greater than 1, so it's greater than 0 dBi. Let me give you some examples. Uh, I'm, I may or may not have talked about any of these antennas yet, but they're perhaps antenna types uh, having names that you recognize. Uh, the directivity of a dipole is usually about 2 dBi. That's for dipoles that are less than half a wavelength or so. Uh, directivity of monopoles is about 5 dBi. That's uh, for monopoles that are less than a quarter wavelength or so. And keep in mind, I'm talking about the maximum directivity, right? The directivity in the direction in which it is maximum. For patch-like antennas, the maximum directivity is about 8 dBi, but can range from about... Um, a few dB up to maybe 9 dB or so. 8 dBi is just kind of a, a typical number. And then, of course, we have antennas which consist of big dishes or antennas which uh, are phased array antennas, which consist of many of these antennas put together uh, as an array, working together. In that case, we can accumulate tens of dBi. So it is common for a big dish or for a phased array to have a maximum directivity on the order of 30 dBi or 40 dBi or in some cases 50 or 60 dBi. So there's the range of uh, maximum directivities that you might expect to see. That concludes this lecture on the transmit characteristics of antennas.